She is the co-editor of the Orhan Pamuk and Global Literature, Existentialism and Politics, and the author of her recent book, Shoah Through Muslim Eyes, which is on display in the back, and after she finishes her lecture today, there'll be a book signing for those of you who are interested. <coughs> Dr. Afridi is also very active in interfaith initiatives, as you can imagine, both nationally and internationally. The title of her talk today is Muslims and the Holocaust, <coughs> Reconciliation and Hope. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Dr. Afridi. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mangwudi, for having me here. And I love the idea of the Baha'i Peace Center um, inviting me here because I think that the more uh, and more we learn from each other, the better the world is. So I want to sort of tell a story um, since you guys are students and I'm so used to having students around me all the time and, and also share some of my scholarship. and. The journey that I've been on as a Muslim woman and also someone who has taught Islam and also teaches the Holocaust specifically and also um, courses on genocide starting with Armenia all the way up to the Rohingya Muslims as you know I mean, you probably have heard about recently in Myanmar. So one of the things that <clears throat> is really important for me to, to share with you is how you can turn things that are negative and also blocks in terms of prejudice into something that's positive and engaging. And one of the ways I want to start with is talk about how I approached my own work and my own book with the kind of frame of being Muslim and what kinds of things that compelled me to talk about um, the deep anti-Semitism in my own community and my challenges with it and how I, how I dealt with it. So I want to begin with um, a quote by actually Ibn Arabi, which I think you would enjoy as students, which says, my heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles and a convent for Christian monks, a temple for idols and pilgrims, and the tablets of the Torah and the book of the Quran. I follow the religion of love, whatever way love's camels take. That is my religion and my faith. So my book and my work recently, Shoah through Muslim eyes, and Shoah, for those of you who don't know, is the Hebrew word for Holocaust. Shoah through Muslim eyes is a journey that I began many years ago. This book and my scholarly interest in Jews, the Shoah, and Judaism was sparked by my desire to understand the other. I decided to write this book as I began to interview survivors, Holocaust survivors, because I wanted not only to tell their stories, but also to join their stories with my experiences of anti-Semitism today. This book is written for everyone to read. It lies between a trade and scholarly book purposely, and I hope my Muslim brothers and sisters will take my general criticism of Muslims as an act of being Muslim. As Muslims, we are taught to accept justice, truth, and equality. It is time that people of all faiths, and even the faithless, start listening to the voices that speak up for the other. Those with a message to all of shared humanity. And as that, an example is a universal message that came to Muslims as believers of Abraham and his family, which is similar to that of Jews and Christians and also to Baha'is. As Muslims recite the following Durud Sharif, which is really an invocation that Muslims recite while mentioning the Prophet Muhammad, and it's usually very complimentary, it says, Oh Allah, let your blessings come upon Muhammad as you blessed Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim. Truly you are the praiseworthy and glorious, O oh Allah, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad as you blessed Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim. Truly you are the praiseworthy and glorious. So something I was raised with was that we were the children of Abraham. And, and Abraham was constantly in my prayers uh, when I re recited my prayers with my parents or even with my friends in my community. And I didn't grow up in a Muslim country. I grew up in Europe, but always was surrounded by some kind of a Muslim community or also my own parents. 
Contrary to its public perception in the contemporary world, the message of Islam has always been a universal one to me, encouraging tolerance, egalitarianism, acceptance of other faiths and cultures. Growing up in many cultures opened up my eyes to the vast differences that can arise because of ignorance, generational intolerance, and how these very differences have been divisive. I can only say that if different people begin to see the suffering and injustice visited on others as their own, there might be some hope for the future of Jewish, Muslim, Christian, and other religions in terms of interreligious understanding and relations. So, I mean, generation is very important in this room. You guys are younger, and I speak to your generation all the time. My son's actually a little older than some of you. So, um, and one of the things you find is how race and prejudice, prejudice prejudice changes, how different generations change in terms of even um, being Jewish American, Muslim American, or Catholic American, and how these different religions are viewed within the fabric of America. And, and an example I want to give you is that at the center, we, I created a fellowship where Muslim students at Manhattan College, as well as Catholic students, and yeshiva local uh, yeshiva students work with a Holocaust survivor all year. And it's interfaith, it's intergenerational, it's, and it's also interracial, and it's amazing, inter-socioeconomic. So these groups, two groups work together all year, and they start to realize how they see themselves differently, including the yeshiva students who do not want anything to do with the Holocaust. Um, they really don't. And they're, then they start listening to the Catholic and Muslim talk about that, and they get very intrigued and get involved with this project. So sharing personally what it felt um, uh, following the attack on the World Trade Center in New York on September 11th, uh, many Muslims, I among them, faced discrimination and were seen as believers in a violent religion and participants in terrorist groups. It was an unbearable time for some Muslims who were attacked because of how they looked or what they wore. We became targets in the United States and Europe. This was a time of reflection and despair for many Muslims. I believe we are still very much, in a sense, seen as either apologetic or defensive, and I know my colleagues in the Islam, um, Islamic scholars have talked about this endlessly. Unfortunately, not much has changed. We still witness attacks both verbally and physically by those who believe that we did not belong in the United States and especially recently. So the attacks against Muslims have increased by 800% in the last eight months. And against Jews, it's increased 230%, which I find fascinating as well. So anti-Semitism is, is really, really on the rise as much as it, Islamophobia is. And Think about that for a second, why that's going on, why Jews and why Muslims. And looking at the two very small minorities here in the United States, um, in Europe less so minorities because there's less populations, uh, population overall in Europe compared to the United States. So I find that always very fascinating. As a Muslim, when you live anywhere as a minority and watch the media talk about your faith in person, as extremist and violent, it is deeply impactful. At times, I admittedly begin to wonder if Islam is buried under an oriented carpet, which is diverse colors and divided patterns. However, I'm surrounded by courageous people who have shown me that self-examination and justice are the path to peace and cooperation with others and living with oneself. So almost uh, six years ago, Manhattan College, which is in Riverdale, New York, which is in the tippy top. If you take the one, if you ever go to New York, take the one all the way up to 242nd Street, get off, that's where my college is. So it's halfway in the Bronx and halfway in Riverdale, New York. They appointed, um, where I teach and where courageously appointed me to direct the Holocaust genocide and interfaith education center. The college, a Catholic LaSallean institution, had enough confidence in me, my work, and my faith as a Muslim and their own institutional values to defy many people in New York and elsewhere who accused the college of hiring a neo-Nazi, Palestinian lover, terrorist, and a Jew hater. So these were the names that, that, that I was called. Um, and there, were, uh, there was an assemblyman in Brooklyn that was very against my hiring, but this, the college really stood by me. And also I want to give you an example that a child of a Holocaust survivor 
law professor and writer, um, wrote that he was puzzled by the center's decision to broaden its focus. He wrote, the moral travesty that was the final solution was not based on faith. An interfaith dialogue, this would have made no difference to the Nazis. He said, while he felt that while a freely, meaning myself, sensitivity to the Holocaust may be genuine, it would be better to allow a Jew to be guardian of this particular history. Jews have a right to be propri proprietary in this, he continued. In a world of multiculturalism and identity politics, everyone owns everyone else's tragedy. Right, so this is a question I have to really think about. Why am I talking about the Holocaust? How do I, or what right do I have as a Muslim to sort of be the guardian of the memory of survivors, but also teach it and give it justice? The controversy around my position was understandable to me, which is kind of weird, right? I mean, I didn't want to be called a neo-Nazi. It it's one of the worst things you can be called. And there were blogs and blogs and blogs talking about this. Yet I was very sad to learn that some Jews believe that no Muslim, no matter how well credentialed or committed, could be trusted. As a guardian of Shoah memory and my commitment to survivors, criticism stings, yet it also triggers, triggers self-examination. I delved deeply into, into my soul and asked myself what business I actually had teaching students about the Shoah. But all I could think of was how important the lessons of the Shoah had been to me and how many survivors had trusted me by sharing their own memories of pain and humiliation. Their act of sharing imposed a responsibility on me. More important, I was frustrated at the appalling lack of understanding of the Shoah in Muslim communities and the growing contemporary anti-Semitism that I had witnessed. Perhaps I could serve as a bridge, I thought, between the abyss that separates contemporary Jews and Muslims. Furthermore, Islam has taught me to be brave in matters of difference and justice. Through the power of difference and acceptance, the Quran has opened up my being to all humanity as equal in the eyes of God. The very con concept of difference in the Quran has beckoned me to seek others in community, whether people of the book or others as part of the world in universal equality. The Quran has inspired me to think through the vulnerabilities of my own community Muslims and recognize weaknesses and failures. It is every person's business to stand up for justice and truth, to eradicate the hatred of our one people, whether, whether it is because of race, religion, or gender. Islam came with the message of Prophet Muhammad, containing the concepts of equality for minorities and women at a time, when these concepts are not even vernacular. I hope to revive these messages in light of the Shoah and recognizing the suffering of the other. So my work is really simply an act of remembering and accepting the Shoah. I believe that my own Thinking about the Holocaust and the Shoah has really transformed me in many ways, but also made me closer to my own faith as a Muslim. And one of the very interesting things that, that I've been able to do is, of course, um, interview um, Shoah survivors and also talk to Bosnian survivors, um, talk to Cambodian survivors and generations after that. And also, we had a program recently at Manhattan College in the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. So one of the things I teach in my work is that you know, genocide does not carry a race, a religion, a color. It can ha it's happened to absolutely everybody we know. And anyone can be perpetrator and victim and bystander at any moment, at any time. And the center that I direct, I've been able to host many educational and emotionally moving events. The interpeace is flourishing. So people ask me, how can you have interfaith and genocide and Holocaust together? I think they are not mutually exclusive at all. So through that, I've tried to create programs where I'm bringing a lot of um, acknowledgement of suffering of the other together in these inter-religious groups. In the last few years, I found some, some interesting pieces in the press and also um, the glimmers of hope of Muslims recognizing the Shoah. In the article in, in Jerusalem Post most recently, uh, and it was in 2016, that they're at a school, this is what an Arab um, Muslim student said. 
At school, I hadn't read a single line about the Holocaust. In the 12th grade, there were lessons about World War II, but still no mention of the Holocaust. In fact, there is no Holocaust in Palestinian history books. <clears throat> I'm currently a law student at a Palestinian university, and still the word Holocaust isn't mentioned anywhere. Yesterday, for the first time, I was privileged to meet a Holocaust survivor. She was standing with her daughter, Susie Nunes. An Israeli filmmaker called uh, Yasmin Novak made a film about Susie's mother called The Last Lost Love Diaries. It is a story of Susie's mother, Elise, and a man called Bernie. They were torn apart by World War II, and 65 years later, Elise decided to read Bernie's diaries and to go on a journey to discover his fate. I don't usually watch romance film, but this one wasn't just a love story or even just a movie. It documents the pain of the millions who suffered and died and of those who survived. Even though my schools and university didn't teach me about the Holocaust, I read about it on the internet and checked some books. But I must admit that what I read wasn't good enough to give me a clear image. Holocaust education isn't only a Jewish issue, it is an issue for humanity. And then, you know, if you, if you read a lot of Holocaust material like I do, you know that there are different arguments within the Jewish community about whether the Holocaust is a human lesson or it's not, or whether it is about Judaism and Jews. So there's also disputes within um, the community that are very interesting. Again, so <laughs> when you start to study a totally different tradition, you start to learn, wow, this is really diverse. And that whole idea of being you know, looking at Israel as homogeneous and being, you know, um, anti-Palestinian or looking at Palestinians as being homogeneous and seeing them as anti-Israeli is really a myth, truly is a myth. Um, violence is not a myth at all because that's what I teach about, but these ideas that we have and we come forth with become mythological. And I really want to work with young people to break those myths as we educate ourselves about different genocides. I want to offer to you today um, <clears throat> a few things that are buried, and these stories are buried because we have media, sensational emotional outpour, we get lost, and we emerge as separated, divided, and we want to defend and hold on to the very contours that carved us in our generations. Ultimately, we lose ourselves in the rhetoric, protecting something that we created called religion, or race, or nationalism. As I listen to conversations between Muslims all over the world about Jews, Israel, and the Holocaust, including in Pakistan, where I was born, the perspective of the overarching discourse and the perception of Jews is significant. Because it is here that I believe we must listen and examine some of the key ideas that shape their reality, as well as the realities that shape the Jewish understanding of the Holocaust. Some of the factors that shape Muslim understandings of the Holocaust are the following. Interpretations of their own experience under colonialism, which has led them to see and understand the Holocaust primarily through their lens. The ongoing Middle Eastern conflict and tensions with Israel. Contemporary experiences of Islamophobia and fears of terrorism. This is from the, from the Muslim and Arab perspective. In many of the conversations I've experienced here are the aspects that shape Jewish understandings of the Holocaust. The still immediate experience of the genocide, many survivors are still alive, a lot are passing away and very frail. The ongoing Middle Eastern conflict and concerns about terrorism and security in Israel and against Jews. Contemporary experiences of ongoing anti-Semitism, including examples from the Arab world, and also fears of terrorism. Some of these factors have fed misperceptions of one another, and then there are misperceptions that stem simply from ignorance of each other's religious traditions, especially history. But as these as aspects show, many of these understandings and misunderstandings are connected in profound ways. They mirror one another, offering an opportunity not just for disagreement, but for some dialogue. So is there a way for interreligious dialogue to make them shared concern or at least common conversations, I ask. In response to these different understandings and sometimes competing interpretations, a growing number of interfaith alliances, documentaries, and scholars have attempted to bridge these gaps. 
And I'm gonna now stop here for a second and show you a few things um, that I think might be of interest to you. Is this here right? Okay. <coughs> Um, all right, so some things that might kind of interest you or you might want to think about of the kinds of work that I'm involved with. So in uh, 2016 was the 500 year of the ghetto in Venice. And it's the oldest ghetto. It was a Jewish ghetto and it opened in 1516. And so I take students from Manhattan College, um, Muslim, uh, very few Jews because we're a Catholic school and we can, we can, I can entertain that question too. But also, we, we go there and we study not just Jewish history, but we also look at contemporary Muslim immigration, North Africans, Bengalis, people are coming into Venice, the notion of the other, right? Europe and the other. And also have them look at <clears throat> what it means to be really segregated and ghettoized. And we make comparisons to other ghettos today um, um, in you know, places like Morocco, the Melas were for Jews at some point, and then further on you have in France, for the Algerians, you have the ghettos as well. So there's a lot of things that we do that are different, and I have them actually talk to local Venetians about what they're feeling about a lot of the Syrian immigrants coming, and if they're feeling that they're welcome or they're not welcome, which is interesting, we did, did a class last Christmas, we're going again in winter break, it's just a two week, two and a half week course, very intensive, but it's very mixed even in Italy in terms of how they feel about immigrants and how they feel about North African, but it's also very, very highly racialized, just like it was for Jews um, in Italy. And, and Italy still has a very high kind of, no, we don't want Jews here either um, kind of feeling. So there's a lot of parallels that we can see. And I find it very interesting when you're actually living in that place and looking at the place together as a class and also the contemporary history in Israel today. <clears throat> so on, on, the, on your left, um, that is actually the Orthodox rabbi's wife, and she speaks to us, and I take my students for a Shabbat dinner. And on the right is the director of the Islamic Center in Mestre, which is in the area of Veneto. And he said something very interesting to me. He said that they're not allowed to have a mosque because they are banning mosques in Italy, um, basically. And he said the problem that he has is that when you ban a mosque or a community center, you actually have a rise or a fear of terrorism. Because if you don't have a place where you can, we can come and talk openly about your questions about Islam, that, you know, you might need uh, marriage counseling, you might need help with kids, community, babysitting, and you're sitting around in basements and garages and you have no one leading you, it becomes a real problem. So he's under a lot of pressure where he wants to have a community center and they didn't allow one. They actually opened up a Coptic church and there's only 450 Coptic Christians versus uh, 70,000 Muslims in that area. Where it was interesting that Italian local public put a pig on the Coptic church because the, if you know anything about Coptic architecture, it's dome-like, right? So they thought it was a mosque. So they, I mean, it was just very ironic, and my students and I happened to be there. So this is something they learned about deep racism and trying to offend people externally symbolically, but also in terms of the history in, in Italy. <clears throat> okay, why the Holocaust and Islam, right? I mean, who does that kind of stuff, right? But um, I, I think it's important because I think it's part, it's part of my history as well and also part of a very big restructuring of the world post-World War II for many, many Muslims um, and Arabs in the world and including the birth of Pakistan, right? Um, Israel is 1948, Pakistan is 1947, right? So there's a lot of really interesting things going on historically in the world that really, really invited me it kind of seduced me into thinking, well, what was going on with Muslims during the Holocaust? You know, where were they? What were they doing? What were the Arabs doing? We never really hear about that. We hear about the great allies, and we hear about, you know, Germany, and that's really it. So, you know, I, I really took my work to North Africa and looking at 
camps, concentration camps that were created under the Vichy government. Um, of course, heralded, her, heralded, heralded by the SS uh, units. And they really basically took over North Africa. Now, North Africa also has a very interesting history in terms of nationalism and independence, especially Algeria. And I, and I found some really interesting memoirs written by um, Algerians in French, actually, not even in Arabic, that talk about this idea of the Israeli and the prison, the, the Jew, and how they suffered together in these places against the colonial rule. There's so much history that was being shared at that point that a lot of people don't even think when they think of the Holocaust or they think of the Shoah. So I want to bring these narratives to some kind of light in contemporary life where we can share these stories and look at the suffering of different levels of suffering, of colonization, and, and the suffering of Jews. What's incredible to me, though, is that if Jews were just tourists in places in North Africa, they were actually taken by the Vichy, given to the Nazis, and taken all the way to Auschwitz. Poland, do you guys realize what, how much work that is, first of all, planning that is, and thinking that goes into that? There was a complete sort of you know, analysis, and, and the argument that I really make in, the, in my book is that the show is unprecedented. I do not saying it's unique. I don't believe in anything being unique because I believe that there is no Olympics of genocide. But I really argue that the Holocaust was the one time that every single Jew was picked <coughs> off the face of the earth, or that at least they tried to pick every single Jew. And there was more collaboration on bystanding during the Holocaust than any other genocide. At the same time, it's unprecedented because of the technological mechanism that was put into the effort of the Holocaust while fighting a World War II. I mean, if you really study the Holocaust, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's a damning affair, but it also really, really, if you follow where Jews were, they were taken from everywhere. But there were a lot of people who rescued Jews that are very unknown. So <clears throat> did Muslims play a role in the Holocaust? I asked myself, why would you teach the Holocaust to Muslims? Why is this work relevant and important today? Um, I have taught um, the Holocaust to some Muslims, of course, at Manhattan College, but I've also had been brought, brought in to teach uh, students um, that are being taught by most other Muslims that are coming from Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Pakistan, uh, Tunisia, all over. And um, it's been very interesting for me to talk to them because they just didn't really have the history or the background ever. So for them it was all about questioning. But we also talked about Islamophobia and the deep divisions that we have today. So did Muslims play a role in the Holocaust? Yes, they did play a role, but they didn't create the Holocaust. Right? They played a role because they were under the Vichy government <clears throat> when the Vichy government was in charge of North Africa. Were they, were they bystanders? Yes, some of them were bystanders because they were told that if they did anything that they would be next. And um, I'll show you that there were Muslims that were killed in Auschwitz and other death camps that we don't know about. Why would you teach the Holocaust to Muslims? Because it's, bar it's a buried story in the Muslim world. And as Muslims, we should acknowledge everybody's suffering, including the suffering of Jews. And it's not a tit-for-tat game. I believe that we must stand up, and we must be the first to say, yes, it happened, and this is exactly what happened, and learn about the history, and learn about how and where Arabs were at that time. <clears throat> what do you know about the Holocaust? I don't know how much of you studied the Holocaust, the Holocaust was a genocide in which Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany and his collaborators killed about six million Jews. I'm just going to read lower down, though, that also some definitions. Oh, sorry, going back. Um, some definitions of the Holocaust include the additional five million non-Jewish victims of Nazi mass murders. We can't forget that many other people were also killed under the Nazis: Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals, Arabs, Muslims. Um, gypsies, Roma Cynthia gypsies. You have all kinds of Catholics um, 
people who were saving Jews were killed. Um, anyone with a disability was killed. Anyone with a handicap was killed. Right. <clears throat> What do you know about colonialism, the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers, and exploiting it economically? So your language was lost, your religion was taken over, right? I mean, colonialism we talk about as if it was imaginary, but it was a real practical kind of destruction of a culture, a changing over, sort of a masking over a country that had a tradition. Uh, whether it was language, whether it was tradition, whether it was um, looking at, um, I mean, I remember my mother saying to me that she went to Catholic school. So she went to a Catholic school where there were nuns in, in, in her country, Pakistan. And then she would come home and do her salat in the Muslim way, and it was kind of normal. It was natural. This was syncretic kind of religion uh, for her. So a lot of us don't really think about how that had an impact. And, and what that meant to Muslims and Arabs all over the world. Especially when you start to learn and teach students who don't know this, is that every Muslim country was colonized, right? And that colonial phase was not a short phase, it was a very long phase. And the impact of that is still lingering and we still feel the imprints of that. So the Holocaust and colonialism is not a comparison. Perhaps we can understand historical context at different times of Jews and Muslims. That's what I would like to put out. Provide an understanding of power structures. Define the many challenges that we face today between Jews and Muslims. Muslims and colonial memories and boundaries should also be addressed. Here's a photograph I thought of interest, concentration camp in Libya. Right? I mean, Libya was under Italy, fascist Italy. And again, um, anywhere that uh, Nazi Germany could get to, they would basically try and incarcerate Jews or kill them um, either in concentration camp in North Africa or bring them back to Poland to the, uh, to the death camps. It's unbelievable, the whole plan, right? Africa in 1940, here's just for you to have an idea of like, look at, look at the control of the world at that time. You have, you know, for example, Libya is in, under a t Italian control. Here you have the Soviet Union up, up uh, north. But look at Egypt, Sudan, Nigeria, Gold Coast. These are British controlled, Vichy French control, Algeria, all of French West Africa, and French Morocco. So just imagine a time where pe any of these countries did not have any independence, right? I mean, this is what colonialism means, you're a colony. Well, we were a colony, right? <laughs> we tend to forget that. Okay, <clears throat> so here I just wanted to share a story, the three years of camps, a year of concentration camp, two years of disciplinary center, 1940 to 1943. Arazki, Berkani, um, who was an Algerian um, man, and he was in a concentration camp with Jews and some uh, resistant fighters. And he wrote a memoir describing what he felt. And he said that the captains there, especially one specific one, Derrico, who was a French uh, Vichy uh, captain, wanted to tear the Arabs and the Jews apart. So he tried to have them fight against each other. And they were so unsuccessful because what instead the Jews and Arabs did was they bonded together and they created this unity against this colonial divide and conquer. And he says that he couldn't believe that because he himself also in his mind felt that the Jewish presence was a European colonial presence. But he understood when the Jews were actually with him that that was not the presence that he had thought the Jews were. These stories are really very important in looking at narratives and how we see people both racially and in terms of power. What was the role of Muslims under the Vichy? Basically, they were subjugated, but some of them did volunteer um, to move bodies, to move um, Jews, or to seek out Jews. Um, they were also um, incredibly frightened 
of what the French would do to them because they were watching what was happening to Jews um, who were put in, in graves and they were alive. And you can imagine being in the desert, heat of 120, and watching people die in that way. That was their very kind of common thing to do, especially in places like Morocco. Were uh, Muslims perpetrators? No, they weren't. I know there's a lot been written about that, and I know that even Prime Minister Netanyahu has mentioned that, actually I have written about it and been quoted about it in the news, that no, indeed, Muslims did not perpetrate the Holocaust. There was a Bosnian, and I'll show you a picture, uh, a Bosnian Hazdar unit that was kind of brought together by um, Al Hosseini, who was not, who did not compel the Holocaust either. He was not favorable to Jews, he was anti Semitic, but he had nothing to do with creating the death camps or the concentration camps. There was a little Hazdar um, army that was created by the Bosnian army, which lasted for two months. Um, and they completely dissip dissipated it. Actually, if you want more on that, there's a great book called Islam in Nazi Germany by David Matado. He's amazing. He's done a lot of archival work really talking about that in depth. And I also mention him in my book. So that's one of the myths that I want to kind of get, get rid of, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about this idea that somehow you know, Muslims or Arabs compel the Holocaust. Muslims and Arabs really didn't know about the Holocaust, except for what <laughs> happened in North Africa. And that's it. I mean, they weren't, they weren't in Treblinka, and they weren't in Auschwitz. They were, after World War II, to, in DP camps, um, a lot of Albanians and Turks that were looking to escape their own kind of economic plight, but they weren't sitting there witnessing, nor did they create the death machine or the murder of Jews, nor was it on their mind. So that is a myth that I really think needs to stop and needs to come out, and I hopefully if I'm willing to come out and say things about anti-Semitism, I think that other than people will listen that it is not a mythological thing. Um, and there were plenty of rescuers, Muslim rescuers, and this is, these are the beautiful stories that we forget. And one of the ways that I wanted to talk about rescuers is that in Tunisia, Khaled Abdul Wahab, um, <clears throat> he also helped a dozen of uh, uh, Jews by hiding them and the, if, you can, if you read his whole story, it's pretty moving. He would, in, he would be entertaining SS soldiers so he could hide families in the backyard, in the back barn. And he died, but his daughter actually went and, and met the, the rescuers, um, um, his, his kids, and thanked them, and they became friends. So he's a protector. And there's also a Nordet organization called Einer Protector, started by an Israeli. Jewish woman who is doing all, all works on Muslim heroes, and she's showing the different face of Muslim heroes. So there's a lot of people doing very interesting work. If you want to eradicate racism, then you can do a lot of things, is by showing different images, different narratives, different stories. Change the narrative. Always change the narrative. In Morocco, you had Sultan Mohammed V, who refused to have his uh, Jewish citizens, who he called Moroccan citizens, to wear the yellow star. Um, he was very favorable um, to the Jews and, and used the Quran and Islam to talk about them being the children of Abraham. So these stories are sort of buried. They just don't come out. And I think these, this is a really good time to tell these stories and to share this. Albanians were amazing. I had an exhibit in 2012 at Manhattan College called Besa, The Promise. And Albania was the only country in Europe to save all of its Jews. And Albania is 70% Muslim and 30% Christian, even today. Not only did they save all the Jews, but they saved Jews that were escaping from places like Greece and let them enter. And so you have all of these stories of Albanians um, thanking um, Jew, Jews thanking Albanians and still continuing a connection. Indians. Inayat um, Nur Khan, one of my heroes, I talk about her at the end of the book, she was a spy for the Allies and she gave up her life and she was killed at Dachau because she would not give up the codes and she was working to save the Jews 
and that's why she was taken to Dachau and killed um, with uh, two other people. And a French woman told on her, and unfortunately she was sought out. <clears throat> There's also a really good documentary about her that came out about two years ago, if you want to see it. And then Turkey, you have Ismail Anekdik Kent, who also was um, in, in France between 1941 and 1944. He gave documents of citizenship to dozens of Turkish Jews living in France who did not have proper identity papers and to save them from deportation to the Nazi gas chambers. So here he helped people um, in France so that he had some kind of connection to citizenship papers. People did that for each other all the time. And many, many Muslims did that, including Iranians. Imams who rescued Jews, um, and there were some Imams that kept Jews in their mosque. If you go to Berlin, there is a really old mosque that actually the Nazi built, Nazis built for the Ahmadiyya community. It was built in 1938. It was like the oldest mosque. But even they rescued Jews in that mosque, even though it was built for them because they wanted to align with certain kind of Muslims and have some kind of allies at that time. So you have a lot of imams who rescued Jews. This was an imam in Paris who rescued Jews. He rescued four Jews. People say there's more, but there's still not enough research done for me to release the number. But I believe that there were four that were rescued, and he also kept them in the mosque. Recently, the first Arab Righteous One, so Yad Vashem, uh, recognizes people who are the righteous ones, the ones who gave up their lives or who, were, who risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. And Dr. Mohammed Helmi was just recognized two days ago. He's the first Arab, right, so to be recognized by Yad Vashem. They wanted to recognize him two years ago, but his family refused to accept the recognition because it was being given by Israel. And so, but there was a relative who said, no, I will, I will receive uh, the recognition. So now we have one Arab who is recognized. So Muslims in the Holocaust is not one story, right? There are many, many stories. And I just want to kind of open up your mind to thinking differently about the Holocaust and Muslims and Arabs and their history. How can we really think about this in a way that we can acknowledge one another in very painful ways, right? I mean, if you sit with Israelis and Palestinians in a room, it's not very easy. And I've been in those rooms. And it's very emotionally terrifying for people. But one has to sort of learn how to do this through acknowledgement of one, one another's suffering, no matter what that suffering is. Here is um, a, a diagram of Muslims killed in camps which I thought you might find interesting because you never see something like this. And this is uh, from 1944. I'm just going to read out the death camps, Auschwitz 1, 2, and 3. And remember, Auschwitz-Birkenau was huge. <laughs> I mean, amazingly huge. Obviously, it killed two, 2 million people within a year and a half. And then Buchenwald, Dachau, Flossenburg, Rosen, Mauthausen, um, Hatweiler, Nürgen, Ravensbrück, uh, which is mainly a women's camp. And you see the, uh, if you see above, um, <clears throat> you have the different kinds of Muslims that were there. You have Albanian, African, Croatian, Polish, Serbian, and then you have um, Turkish again. So it gives you a list of people that were killed with Jews at these camps. Why is this chart important to me? It's for us to acknowledge that many people suffered together, including Muslims, right? And that Muslims were also taken to death camps and to stop the crazy denial of Holocaust, which goes on way too often in places like Iran, but by a small group of people. Muslims in DP camps, there are many Albanians, Russians, Eritreans, and Syrians um, because they were fleeing from communism, fascism, and economic poverty. Um, there's a lot of really good research on that. I have a few slides here of Muslim Turk who was captured by Germans. Very interesting work. Not much has been done, but just uh, recently the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum just has 70,000 new documents in the tracing services. So I've only been through like 123, but that took me a long time too, because not all of them are written in a way you can read. These are a couple of documents that you can actually read. 
It says, applicant is a Russian-born Muslim who claims to have been deported in 1942 by the Germans to Lithuania and from there to Germany. He could not produce any documents on his activities during the war except a work certificate, which proved to be false upon checking by this control center. And then considering the above data, there is every reason to believe that applicant tries to conceal facts which would make him ineligible if known. So a lot of people were denied entry into places. A lot of them were denied because of the way they looked or if they were Muslim or they, looked, they had a crooked nose or it's very interesting to look at these documents and see where these people ended up. Here's another document. I won't read it, but these are just examples. This is from 1948 from a DP camp, uh, again, a na Turkish uh, national, and claimed that he was married to a German woman. And here also he was denied. Here again, um, another applicant was born in Turkey. She married in 1924. She was actually accepted. and they resettled her. So what can we really learn? And before I, I stop, I just want to read my last piece in my talk to you. It's one of my probably most moving things that I did. So I interviewed um, a Holocaust survivor, <clears throat> Albert Rosa, who's still alive. At that time, he was 85, so I've been in New York now six years, so he is now, wow, mashallah, 91 he is. So he escaped from, he was Greek, and he was living on Rhodes Island, and he was taken to Auschwitz Birkenau. He actually built it with his own hands. And then when he was rescued, um, or liberated, which a lot of people don't like that word, but when he was liberated, he actually started to kill and hunt down SS guards. I mean, this guy was just amazing. And you should just, being in his presence was like, wow, I couldn't believe his energy. So, but the one thing that he didn't have was education. And he shared that with me. And I was very, very touched by him. But I want to share how I became, how I couldn't ignore these stories as a human being. And I had to tell these stories and become part of that telling um, for, survivors. Excuse me. So on February 27th, 2010, I looked into the sky blue eyes of Albert Rosa, an 85-year-old Shoah survivor. For three hours as he spoke about his experience at Auschwitz Birkenau, as I left him, he told me with tears in his eyes that he wanted someone to write his life story. As he had very little formal education, and would not be able to express in writing his feelings on the Shoah. He asked me, how can I express in words how I felt when my sister was bludgeoned to death in front of me by a Nazi woman, or when I saw my elder brother hanging from a rope when I had tried to defend him? I looked into his eyes, which had, which had pierced me all day, and wondered how I could tell his story in words without losing the sense of emotional and physical strength it had taken him to survive the horror of his life in the camps. He spoke of maggots crawling on his body as he was ordered to move the dead Jewish brothers and sisters, the gold he stole from the teeth of the dead, the urine he saved to nurse the wounds inflicted by a German shepherd, the plant roots that he dug out with his fingers for nourishment, the ashes he swallowed from the crematorium as he helped build Birkenau. How was I to give these events any life with mere words? These feelings of paralysis emerge as I write this testimony. How can I give the Shoah a life of its own without trespassing on politics, ethics, and the millions of victims? In some ways, I feel like abandoning this project because I fear that I could not do it justice. However, when I try to repress the impetus of this work, which is to me a simple acknowledgement to the victims and Jews of the Shoah by a Muslim, I simply cannot. I'm even more drawn to the project. But what of those, what of those that, that were not there? The Holocaust cannot be reduced to order or even an overriding sense of meaning. The event defies meaning and negates hope. How then are we to approach it? I. <clears throat> And when I reflect on this question, I hear the voices, I see the deep eyes, I feel the strength, the pride, 
and the memory of men and women who have taken their lives in directions that are unimaginable, so that they can sit and tell their stories to a stranger, a Muslim woman. When I left Albert's home, I gave him a hug because my words of gratitude seemed incomplete and he smiled as he hugged me back. He said, this is the first time in my life that I've hugged a Muslim woman. I told him that this should not be the last time as Muslim women are not so cold or segregated as people might think. Albert and I exchanged the first step in dialogue by hugging one another. Thank you.